Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. So glad you're with me as we cover a lot of ground, quite a few miracles, some great teachings as we cover Matthew chapter 8, Mark 2 through 4, and Luke chapter 7. Some highlights where I'm headed today. In these chapters are a lot of examples of relationships and how your faith influences those around you, whether it's family or friends or, or an associate, a worker that's with you. And one of the things that's taught in these chapters is that Christ's atonement includes overcoming not just sin and death, but the inequities and the unfairnesses in life. And also, the kingdom of God is compared to things like a mustard seed. And I'm going to compare it to a ship. Mark chapter 2 starts in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is the home away from home from Jesus, in, for Jesus during his ministry. This is actually a picture of the ruins of Capernaum right there in the middle. Oops, got to go back. In, there's my cursor right in the middle. Uh, above this, this newer looking uh, place is a building that's built over the traditional site of Peter's home. You know, where Peter's talking about Peter and his wife. So that's right here. And this is not the original synagogue that would have been there in the time of Christ, but it's one that's been built over the top of it, and that's the ruins. And then you can see here is the ruins of what Capernaum would have been like uh, anciently. So we start off in Capernaum. And the first miracle that we have is really, for me, one of the great examples of the influence of friends. So as a man is healed from palsy, you may recall the story. These friends get there and Christ has recently healed somebody and people are following him and they follow him into this home and there is no way to get into the home. It's just a crowded thing. You can just imagine people everywhere, especially if you thought, hey, Jesus is coming here and he's healing people. There's probably things that people that you would want to take to visit Christ too. They're there and these friends are, are bringing their friend in, there's four of them, and they don't see no way to get, cry, get this their friend to Christ. So they take apart some of the roof and lower him down to visit with Christ. In Mark chapter 2, and again after he entered into Capernaum, after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house, it would be pretty popular too, straightway many were gathered together, insomuch there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The Pharisees, they form an identifiable group. They're not just based in Jerusalem. There are Pharisees in kind of spread out all throughout Israel. And Pharisees, you've got you know, probably several thousand at this time. They're very influential, and they don't necessarily come from the upper levels of society, but they're spread throughout. Pharisees and scribes, just so you're aware, resolve, reside in these small towns and the cities across country, not only in Jerusalem. So you can probably think about, you, you know the miracle where Christ looks at him. And by the way, I showed the, the chosen little episode, little clip from the chosen as I you know, talked about this with my class in, in seminary really liked the way they did it. And my focus was, how do you help your friends? How does your faith bless your friends? And then I just kind of talked to them about, you know, how can you become that type of friend? The friend that isn't just taking someone to Christ, you do make the invitation, and then, ah, oh, there's a little bit of a, well, there's people in the way, it's not convenient for me, do you give up? Or do you go that extra mile? And I asked them, okay, if there are four pillars of friendship, because there's four friends taking this guy. That's why I'm doing the four, and four symbolic of completeness, your complete friend. What would you say are the four greatest aspects of friendship? And I extend it to four pillars of family relationships. And I talk to him, how do you help influence a friend to come to Christ so they can be healed? Maybe it's the wound that you see, and maybe it's the wound that you don't see. Mark chapter 2, uh, verse 8, immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, that they so reason within themselves. And he said unto them, Why reason ye things in your hearts? Whether it's easy to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, 
and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into the house. And I find this is a fascinating thing. He, I think, and I'm reading between the lines here, has been come to be healed of palsy. And that's not what Christ addresses first. His first more important thing is, your sins are forgiven you. Maybe there's a priority here. That is maybe more important to Christ. And, and it just makes me think, what are some of the reasons why individuals might not seek the Lord's forgiveness for their sins? And how can friends influence, family members influence people to seek the Lord's forgiveness for their sins? And I know I'm reading a lot into this, but maybe this guy who has had the palsy has been at a disadvantage his entire life. And I think of the years that he spent not being able to do some things because of his disability, because of this disease, because of the illness. And I just want to share four different quotes for, from, for you about maybe you know there are some things that happen in life that perceived that we think are unfair. It's not fair that we always get these things happening to our lives. We wish that things were a little bit better. Whether it's perceived or real or not, I love what the apostles have taught about it. Elder David A. Bednar taught this, The Savior has suffered not just for our iniquities, but also for the inequality, the unfairness, the pain, the anguish, and the emotional distress that so frequently beset us. There is no physical pain, no anguish of soul, no suffering of spirit no infirmity or weakness that you or I ever experienced during our mortal journey that the Savior did not experience first. Elder Scott has also taught the same lines. The atonement will not only help us overcome our transgressions and mistakes, but in his time it will resolve all the inequities of life. Those things that are unfair, which are the consequences and circumstances, or other others' acts, and not our own decisions. So, so maybe an illness works there, but maybe something's happened to us because of the neglect or because of someone else's actions. Elder Quentin L. Cook also added, Jesus Christ is our Savior and Redeemer, whose atonement not only provides for salvation and exaltation, but also will compensate for all the unfairness of life. And I love the way Elder Christofferson stated, the Savior's suffering in Gethsemane and his agony on the cross redeem us from sin by satisfying the demands that justice has upon us. He extends mercy and pardons those who repent. The atonement also satisfies the debt justice owed to us by healing and compensating us for any suffering we innocently endure. For behold, he suffereth the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children, who belong to the family of Adam. And a little bonus thought, Elder Worth, when the Lord compensates the faithful for every loss, that which is taken away from those who love the Lord will be added unto them in his own way. While it may not come at the time we desire, the faithful will know that every tear today will eventually be returned a hundredfold with tears of rejoicing and gratitude. And, and I agree, the Lord loves us. He wants us to understand his willingness to forgive. All of us, including those struggling to overcome addictive behaviors such as substance abuse or pornography, and those close to them, can know the Lord will recognize our righteous efforts and will willingly forgive when repentance is complete. Now, maybe that's reading a little too much into a man with palsy. But sometimes we get things in our life that are un we perceive as unfair. And maybe one day the Lord will sit us down and say, Here's why it happened to you. And maybe it was like 2 Nephi chapter 2 where Lehi explains to his son, yeah, you've suffered some really bad things because of the rudeness of your brothers, Laman and Lemuel. Sometimes we do. But part of the atonement is God makes that of all the unfairness, all the iniquity or inequality that happens to us in life. And I know he, over, he was willing to forgive us. So verse 23, we're, we're still kind of following along. This change of scene, he leaves Capernaum, and it came to pass that as he, Christ, goes through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, 
And his disciples, as they went, they began to pluck the ears of corn. And you may think, why is he going through a cornfield? And why is he doing that on Sabbath? Just, you know, under law of Moses, it's permitted if you're walking through a, a wheat field, a cornfield, to, to just eat some things as you walk through. Deuteronomy 25, 23, 25. When thou comest in the standing corn of thy neighbor, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand. But thou shalt not move a sickle under thy neighbor's standing corn. Don't be stealing it. But if you're hungry and you're walking through, it's okay to have some. We're, we're, we're sharing this. The Pharisees have the interpretation that because you go like this, it's now work and you can't do it on the Sabbath. And to which Christ says, said to the Pharisees, verse 24, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not unlawful? Oh, sorry, Pharisees, why do they do on the Sabbath day which is not unlawful? But Christ's great teaching on the Sabbath, he saith unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. You probably know that as, as I create these, I'm getting pictures off, off of the internet. And you can tell I, I keep on the where it's from, and you can see on the bottom of this the, the site that it's from. I want to make sure and give credit for those people who are much more creative than I am. As I was searching for pictures on this one, it just of note to me, I got pictures like this, where it is someone in a park on a Sabbath, just relaxing, or camping, or doing all these things where it is, hey, the Sabbath is made for man, and let me do my own thing because this is the day God made for me. There's an emphasis, it seems to me, not on worshiping God on the Sabbath in modern day culture, but being more, making that a day for you. The church has recently put an emphasis in the you know, last five, six, seven years on Sabbath day observance, in keeping the Sabbath day holy. And maybe it may be a time to say, yes, God made the Sabbath for us, but for what reason? How is the Sabbath day helping us? How has the Sabbath day blessed us as we've kept it holy? I love the way Elder Perkins explained it. When the church made this emphasis on the Sabbath day observance, his summary is, the purpose of the church's recent emphasis on Sabbath observance is to help Latter-day Saints living in an age of doubt and fear increase faith in their Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And several owner uh, and, and other general authorities in that roundtable, because I'm doing this quote, are saying a similar thing. The emphasis is about increasing faith in Jesus Christ. The Sabbath is made for us, and then I would maybe add for me, to increase our faith in Christ. If our actions on that day are considered, what Isaiah would say, as delightful as a delight, and we refrain from doing the things that we would do normally. I'm going back, okay, on the Sabbath. This is Isaiah 58. But maybe focusing more on our faith in Him and, and, and strengthening that. Then that's the purpose of the Sabbath. Now, now moving on, withered hand. You, you have we have a series of just wonderful um, miracles by the Savior. The Savior just starts off. And saith unto them, still the context of Sabbath, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or kill. And they know, hey, this is, this is not a question I want to answer because he's right. So they're quiet. And just reiterating Isaiah, Isaiah 58, 13, if there's the promise, you turn your, your foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure, the things, the, the things that you would do for you, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him. Not doing thy own ways, not doing your own thing, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking thy own, thine own words. There's an idea here that on the Sabbath you should be speaking the words of the Lord, what the Lord is you're learning about him from prophets and apostles, and what maybe the Spirit is teaching you and having you say. Then, verse 14, thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord. I will cause thee to ride in the high places, that spiritual uplifting places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father. 
and the heritage of, of Jacob I just love as a heritage of obedience, a heritage of joy, a heritage of the prophets. Elder Quentin L. Cook said, For members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, honoring the Sabbath is a form of righteousness that will bless and strengthen families, connect us with our Creator, and increase happiness. The Sabbath can separate us from what, from that which is frivolous, inappropriate, or immoral. It allows us to be in the world, but not of the world. Truly keeping the Sabbath day holy is a refuge from the storms of this life. It is a sign of our devotion to our Father in Heaven. Now, following Mark, there's also the calling of the Twelve Apostles. And just want to point something out about the calling of the Twelve. In the first year of the Savior's ministry, Matthew 4, Mark 1, and Luke 5, Jesus calls them, but he's inviting them to walk with him, to not be apostles, but to be disciples. That's when he calls them and says, okay, you're out fishers. Hey, leave your nets and, and come follow me. Not a formal calling to the Quorum of the Twelve, but as a calling to come follow him and spend time with him to be his disciples. I love the imagery of the nets because Elder Worthlin used this masterfully. As Jesus says, leave your nets and come follow me. Elder Worthlin made this comparison to us today. Nets come in many shapes and sizes. The nets that Peter, Andrew, James, and John left were tangible objects, tools that helped them earn a living. Nets are generally defined as devices for capturing something. In a more narrow but more important sense, we might define a net as anything that entices or prevents us from following the call of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. It is impossible to list the many nets that can ensnare us and keep us from following the Savior. But if we are sincere in our desire to follow Him, we must straightway leave the world's entangling nets and follow Him. As the clatter and clamor of life bustles about us, we hear shouting to come here and to go there. In the midst of the noise and the seductive voices that compete for our time and our interest, a solitary figure stands on the shores of the Sea of Galilee calling quietly to us, Follow me. Unfortunately, many are too entangled in their nets to heed the call. And so maybe you, know, you should consider that a net analogy. You can think, okay, in my life, what are the entangling nets? What net does the Spirit help you identify that may be entangling me and keeping me away from Christ? And is there a net that's keeping me away from fully giving myself to God? And are you willing to abandon any of those nets that interfere with that relationship that you have with God or, or your ability to serve Him with all your, your mind, your, your heart, your soul? Now, if I was, just so you know, if I was in a class and I was doing the analogy of the nets, I'd just say, hey, here's three questions. Let me give you some time to ponder. Not as I want, you necessarily have to have an answer. And maybe one comes, maybe one doesn't. This is kind of your time doing a scripture journal. I love them to have time when they ponder in scripture journals. And the act of writing, I think, helps them crystallize their thoughts and, and consider these things a little more deeply. So back to the, the first year. Okay, you got Matthew 4 and Mark 1, and Luke 5, beginning of the first year of Christ's ministry. Christ calls as formal calls to be apostles. That happens in Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 3, and Luke chapter 6. Now, Matthew and Luke, they, he, they put them at you know towards the end of the first year of his ministry. Mark puts that at the beginning of the second year of his ministry. So whatever it is, they're calling to leave their nets is at the beginning of the year. The calling formal calling for them to be an apostles is at the end or the beginning of the next year. So if you kind of summarize, these disciples are with Christ about a year before their formal calling to be an apostle. I just love just that idea that he doesn't just call them out of nowhere. He's waiting with them. He's helping them to develop. And I think Christ knows who he's going to call as his apostles early on. But maybe he allows them to prove to themselves their commitment to him. So just, just a note. And Christ calls his apostles. He gives them power. He gives them authority. 
Mark chapter 3. We're kind of using Mark as a basis as we go through things today. And he ordained 12, that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach, and gave power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Now, I love those verses because these 12 are now set apart a little bit. They have authority given to them to be his apostles, coming from the Greek word, to be one who is sent forth to represent Christ in where they're going. Um, and just tell you a little bit about them. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all 12 very, very briefly. By not order that Matthew, Mark, or Luke list them, but maybe in the order that they die. Okay, maybe that's morbid, but that's the way I'm doing it. Okay, so Judas Iscariot, uh, Iscariot, that last name, I, we don't know where it really comes from. His hometown is Kenneret, so kind of Iscariot. And some scholars like think, okay, he's Judas from Kenneret, and that's how he got the name. There's another few scholars that go, actually, maybe he got it from the Iscari, Iscari. Uh, the Iscari is like a, a dagger that used to be used by... Um, by those people who were against Roman overlords. They're kind of a rebel movement. Either way, that's kind of where he is, and Judas is the one, and always he's listed last in, in the Gospels. He's the one because he is the one who betrays Christ. And it is Judas, I know in, in, in Matthew, I think it's Judas uh, who was called, who was the betrayer, that better translated as became, right here and now he is very favorable towards Christ. He has a great attitude towards Christ. He becomes the betrayer. He becomes the one who, who sells out Christ. So James, uh, the son of Zebedee, um, and he's beheaded in 42. We have Philip, who is uh, crucified in 54 AD. And we think he only comes from the town of Bethesda. And he's featured a few times in the feeding of the 5,000 and his approach to the Greeks and seeking an audience before Christ. Uh, Matthew is, tradition has it, that he is killed in Ethiopia in 60 AD. He is the publican. Um, he's the one that's credited um, in the Joseph Smith translation as ascribed to the authorship as the author of the first gospel. James, the son of Alphaeus, now, James traditionally is killed with a Fuller's Club at about 94 years old, pretty uh, pretty old for him. Now, this is going back to James. This is not James, the brother of Jesus Christ. We'll get that to the end, but a different James. Andrew is the son of Jonah. He's crucified in 69 AD. Now, this is the brother of Simon or Peter. Uh, he is Peter's fishing partner. Sometimes people think that tradition is he's the younger brother of Peter. And might as well get Peter. Peter Bar, or son of Jonah. Uh, his name is, is Simeon, Simeon, Simon. And then his change to Peter, which has that word play on rock and revelation. And at time when he was crucified, tradition has it that he didn't feel like he was still worthy to be crucified the way Christ would be. And the request was, hey, can I be crucified upside down? And the people who are in charge of crucifixion, all they care is that it's painful and then they get killed. So he's like, yeah, 69, 7 AD, yeah, you can be crucified upside down. We also have Levius Thaddeus. Uh, he's crucified about 72 AD. Now, in other places, he's called Judas the brother of James or Judas the son of James. This is uh, more of the Greek term, Greek name for him. That's a little bit different, so you know. Bartholomew, oh my, just saying it, you know, we don't know hardly anything about it, about him. And there's not much mentioned. He's in the list of the 12 apostles. Tradition has it that he was uh, skinned alive and beheaded. Ooh, ick. Okay, we got Thomas. Now, uh, Thomas is one who, and, and, and this is just unfortunate, by one act, you, the, the apostles are testifying, hey, Jesus, he's the Christ, we've seen him, he's resurrected, and he's like, ah, I'm not going to see it until I, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. That one statement gives him a nickname, uh, the doubter, right? But he seems to be, other than that, just rock solid. Um, he's killed in India, tradition has it in 72 A.D., Simon the Canaanite, that's the other one. He's 
Uh, tradition has it that he is crucified in Britain, England, uh, 74 AD. He's also called Simon the Zealot. Now, now, back then, that doesn't mean that he was a part of some group that was anti-Roman, that it was a political kind of zealous, zealousy. But that title was given to Simon the Zealot because of his zealousness towards the law of Moses, not a political kind of thing. And the last son of Zebedee is John, uh, or John the Revelator. We have a lot of his writings. The Gospel according, or really, Joseph Smith translation calls it the Testimony of John. He also writes the first, second, and third books of John, which are the uh, letters from John and the book of Revelation. And so that's kind of a, a summary. And all these traditional deaths of the apostles come from the, the manual the, uh, of Jesus the Christ that's on the church's website. Now, there are three also miracles that Matthew met, mentions. And just kind of part of the reading, I'm leaving Mark for just a minute. There is a healing where a centurion servant is healed in, in, in Luke and in Matthew. And following Luke, Luke 7, 1 through 10 is this. The next few verses, Christ goes to Nain and heals a, a widow's there and ra heals a son, raises him. Which for a widow, you don't have anybody else to take care of you. This is the person who's taking care of you. It's a big deal to her, not just emotionally, but for her care. And then in Luke 36 to 50, Christ goes to a place where he is anointed with oil. And as he's being anointed with oil, there's some little bit of well, why is this happening? And Christ is like, okay, tells a woman, talks about once again, forgiveness, forgiveness of her sins. And there's a little bit of, oh, wait, wait, why are you doing that? And Jesus teaches this at time, and I'm going to pause here for this teaching. Chapter 7, verse 41, there's a certain creditor who had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. I mean, okay, generous for both. Tell me, here's Christ's question, which of them will love him most? And the answer, well... Whoever probably that he forgave the most is going to love the most. And Christ said, exactly. Wherefore, verse 37, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but unto whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he saith unto him, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat began to say within themselves, who is this? that forgiveth sins also. I mean, he's just been doing these miracles, but man, who is this guy? And he said unto the woman, verse 50, thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. And, and, and I just kind of summarize, I think, how was the centurion servant healed? I'm going to guess they're friends, but this centurion or leader of a hundred feels some obligation towards his servant. I think our faith can bless our friends. Or maybe this you could say this in the context of a coworker. Our faith can bless our coworkers. In the widow at Nain, our faith can influence and bless our families. And our faith saves us. You're saved because of your faith in Christ. And and I think that what the Savior emphasizes there is go in peace. Our faith in Christ can give other people's peace. And I just bring that out kind of because I think those three miracles, you kind of take them together. It just is for me is saying we, our faith can help bless others in our lives. Any relationship we have, worker, friend, family, in our relationship with God, our faith blesses us in every aspect of life. And I love just the imagery, probably because I like oceans and, and beaches and, and seas. In Mark chapter 4, and he, Christ, began to teach by the seaside. What I mean, isn't that a beautiful place? You go by the shore. Hey, you want to be teaching? Hey, can we have class outside by the, by the beach? Yeah, that's the answer. Well, they'll all be distracted. So he began to be teached by the seaside. Seaside. Tongue twister. And he was gathering of them a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship. And I can just picture it. People are crowded. They want to get closer and closer. So that's the advantage. Let's take him out in the ship. 
and just be a little bit off the shore. So as he teaches, people can all have a little bit, maybe a little bit closer, but there's also this little barrier that he can be able to address everybody. Goes into the, sh into the ship, he's out there. Multitude is on the land. And I love three comparisons. Two he makes, and then I hope you don't mind that I make one additional one, because of the context of what it is. He says, okay, first Mark chapter 4, he's just been teaching about the sower, and, and I'll cover that again a little bit later. A seed that is sown. How's the kingdom of God? Like a seed that is sown. Sown in our, in our hearts. How's the kingdom of, of heaven? Like a mustard seed. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about mustard seed, but one of the things that I do with my students, and, and I'll show you when we get to there in Matthew, um, I give them mustard seed. And then I kind of just say, I give them a piece of tape and tape it into your scriptures right here. And this year with electronics, I don't know, tape it to the back of your phone. You know, I won't do that to them, but here's a mustard seed and you can keep it and tape it somewhere, probably their scripture journals. So you can see how small it is. And the kingdom of God is like that because it's going to start small and become great. And then there's also the ship. Number one, Christ is teaching from a ship. And think, how's the kingdom of God like a ship? Because as they're out on the ship, first, he's teaching from it. And, and the kingdom of God is a place where Christ can help teach us. It's the vehicle, the mechanism to help get the word to us. But also later on, you get the end of chapter Mark chapter 4. They're on the ship. And there's a storm. And they're in danger. And Christ is there asleep. And they're like, what do you do? How can you be sleeping? And we're rocking around. Master, we're about to be destroyed. How can you sleep at a time like this? Well, I love the analogy that Brigham Young gave and Elder Ballard continued on. Now, this is a quote from Elder Ballard comparing the kingdom of God to the ship like in Mark chapter 4. Elder Ballard said, quote, President Brigham Young commonly employed the old ship Zion as a metaphor for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He said on one occasion, we are in the midst of the ocean. A storm comes on, and as sailors say, she labors very hard. I'm not going to stay here, says one. I don't believe in this ship Zion. But we're in the midst of the ocean. I don't care. I'm not going to stay here. Off goes the coat. He jumps overboard. Will he not be drowned? Yes, so with those who leave this church. It is the old ship Zion. Let us stay in it. On another occasion, President Brigham Young also said he was worried about people losing their way when they were being blessed, when life was good. It is in calm weather, when the old ship Zion is sailing with a gentle breeze, and when all is quiet on deck, that some, have the, some of the brethren want to go out in the whaling boats to have a swim, and some get drowned. Others drift away. Others get Again, get back to the ship. Let us stick to the old ship, and she will carry us safely into the harbor. You need not be concerned. Well, you just kind of make those comparisons like the kingdom of God is like a ship. And we're in a period, I, I think, of history where we're, we're facing an increasing storm, where we can picture being in the church and we're being rocked back and forth. We know we're in the church. We know there's safety there. We know Christ is with us. But we can also tell we're in the middle of a storm. And it's just fun to think and maybe have list and have a discussion. How does church help us during life's storms? And maybe the idea of what, what peace have you felt knowing Christ is within the ship, that this is Christ's church. He's here. He's with us. Even though we're being tossed to and from, and I think if I'm teaching this in class, I'm going to ask, what are the advantages of being a member of the church? What does it offer you? Because the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the vehicle that's getting us to being back with Heavenly Father. This is what the Lord set up. And I love that analogy of a, of a boat. And maybe students can maybe uh, get a car analogy a little bit better. But I want to add one other last thing kind of a thought, because it comes up several times in the readings, and I've skipped over it, is about the relationships Christ has with people of his hometown and his family. 
Christ is one who knows how it is to grow up in in a part member family. Part of Christ's family believe him and part don't. The part that believe him is mom and dad. Now, first, we talk about those who are his friends, the people he grew up with. Mark chapter 3, his friends come up and they're worried for him. He's about their teaching. They're like, he's saying some things that are crazy. For them, in Mark 3 verse 21, they say, he's beside himself. They want to take him. They want to bring him back. They kind of want to rescue him from saying what he's saying. They think Christ has flipped out and they want to take him home and set him straight. That's an interesting way to have the friend you grew up with uh, have the relationship with them where they think you're kind of crazy. His relationship with family. In John chapter 7, 3 through 5, it talks about his brethren. This is brothers, is the way you read it. And it says in verse 5, neither did his brethren, his brothers, believe in him. You have a family where Christ's younger siblings don't believe in what he's teaching or in him. You get that reiterated in Mark chapter 3, verses 31 to 35. This is coming back to his family relationships. Where his brethren, his brothers, and his mom come to see Christ. And they're waiting outside. Hey, family's here. Brothers are here. Mom's here. And Christ is like, well, let me teach you something about believing in me first. Because this is more important. Remember, brothers don't believe. Mom always believes. Mom is faithful. As far as we know, dad was always faithful. Okay, rock solid. But brothers don't believe. And then he teaches in Mark chapter 3, quote, those who do the will of God. That's my brother. That's my sister in the gospel. That's my mother. He's not saying mom doesn't believe, but he's trying to teach. If you want to have that relationship with me, you have to have faith in me. Mark chapter 6. Now, we get to this a little bit later, but I'm going to bring it up here. They people are asking about Christ. Hey, isn't this the carpenter son? Isn't this the son of Mary we're talking about? Doesn't he have brothers? Doesn't he have sisters? And they enumerate the, the kids that Joseph and Mary had, the younger siblings of Christ. So they list out Jesus the names of four brothers that Jesus has. And they say sisters, plural. So the family of Joseph and Mary is at least nine big. Got mom and dad. Jesus, four brothers, and at least sisters too, plural. Okay, got my fingers up. Nine. So at least two sisters. That's the family of Christ. And Mark notes that they, the family, were offended at him. Doesn't appear that this time, as Christ is having his ministry, that they believe he is the chosen one. But it does turn out well, and I add this addendum, because after the resurrection, it appears from everything we know, if both tradition and in Scripture, that these siblings are faithful members. They become converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, there's a reference that Christ appeared to his brother James. There's some faith that James has to be able to have that experience. So just that thought of relationships with Christ, and then maybe if it added one thing for your understanding of Christ, Christ knows knows what it's like to grow up in a family where not everybody's in harmony with the gospel. Not everybody believes the same thing. And for Christ, maybe there's a little bit of opposition in that family. So just some teaching ideas, and, and you may just, in your context of a family, you may just emphasize that. He knows what it's part to be a part part of a part member family. And maybe there's a consideration that you emphasize the blessings of staying in the the church, in the old ship Zion. And one of the major themes for me, as I kind of weave through this, is the influence that we have with our faith on maybe co-workers, on friends, on family, how our faith helps us, connects us, And as Christ says, saves us and gives us peace. I do know that Christ's atonement can not just heal us emotionally or physically or spiritually, but it includes overcoming the inequities and the unfairness that happens in life. Thanks for spending a few minutes with me today as we study Matthew chapter 8, Mark 2 through 4, and Luke 7. I know it was a lot. Have a great day. Keep smiling.